Hey guys, you're welcome to another episode of the Founders Connect. Here I have conversations with amazing entrepreneurs leading tech startups in Africa. And this is going to be episode one of season two. That's right, like literally we are in season two. I can't believe it. <laughs> right, so season one started and we had an interview with um, Atu, the CEO of Bitsika. And when I did that interview, I didn't realize then that this was going to become a thing. But next thing I know, I was reaching out to founders and they were saying, yes, let's do it. Yes, yes. I'm like, oh they want to speak to me okay now let's go there and so we had Ezra of Paystack we have Tosin of Money Africa we had Yam of Bamboo we have Oyenka of Farm Crowd we have Yinka of Kudi we had Chidioki of Kabo it's a lot literally 10 different episodes and now we're starting season two and season two is going to be so amazing we're going to have Tito Ovia of Helium Health I know you guys are excited for that one we're going to have E of Andela and Future Africa we're going to have Tommy of True we're going to have Dami of Shota we're going to have Ebun of Bento and on and on and on until we get to another 10 episode and there will be a season three I guess you have to stick around to find out but first of all let's watch this video and today's episode we're going to be speaking to Tito Ovia the co-founder of Helium Health Welcome to my YouTube channel. I am PC Timmy, a change maker, professional, and creative who is passionate about growing people and growing businesses. Like, comment, subscribe to my channel, and please always share my videos. It promises to always be impactful and insightful. Hi, Tito. I'm so excited to have you here. Hi. I'm excited <laughs> to be here too. How are you doing today? Well, I'm very tired. Um, there was a wedding yesterday. Ah, so I went to go out. Fact, I've lost my voice, everything <laughs> like that. I was a bridesmaid as well, so I was up oh, at 5 a.m. Wow. Oh, was no, no, no. Oh, it, was, it was a lot. I'm, I'm tired. So and she's here. I'm Aww. here for you. <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm really excited to get to know you and just learn about everything you guys are doing at Helium Health. It's definitely, it's definitely. So, where, where do you want me to start? <laughs> Soon. <laughs> Okay, so my first question is, who is Tito? How would you describe yourself in five phrases? Huh. Five words? I think it has to be more than five words. Okay, go ahead. Um, <laughs> but uh, Tito is passionate. Um, Tito is caring. Mm -hmm. Tito is a protector. Um, Tito is... Tito always thinks she's right. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is like some therapy stuff. Um, and yeah, Tito loves healthcare. Oh, yeah. Amazing. When did you know that you loved healthcare? So it's, it's interesting, right? It, it sort of fell into it by accident. And, um, you know, when I say that was. You know, I remember when I was nine years old, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like eight, nine. And, you know, I would always go to school because I used to go to school, to, I used to go to AIS. So we would cross the bridge, follow more bridge, and there'd be traffic, things like that. And I remember just thinking to myself, and, you know, and again, I'm young, I'm privileged, I don't know all these things, right? <laughs> and I'm seeing, you know, beggars on the road, and we still see them to today, right? Yes. With whether they have tumors or burn victims, things like that, or elephantiasis. And I remember I would really ask my mom that, oh, why wouldn't they just go to the hospital? Mm. And of course, you know, my mom is trying to explain that well, they can't afford to go to the hospital. And that was the yeah, wildest thing to me because I said we would cough. And my dad would be like, oh yeah, we're going abroad. <laughs> okay? You know, it was, it was it, it's a very normal thing in my family to mm. do even like yearly checkups, right? right? So I remember, you know, the <laughs> the excitement part was like, okay, we're going on holiday. But then we then spend like maybe like a couple days in the hospital, my brothers and I, and we would do hearing tests, we'll do eye tests, we'll do... Da -da -da. That's and a then, wild they would <laughs> Like they would check the literally tallest strand of our hair to like the bottom of our toes, like everywhere. Because my parents were just very oh, we have to make sure that everything is okay. Mm -hmm. And they're the kind of people that, oh, we'd rather know if something is wrong with that child in the beginning than Dan, put our I head in the sand, right? And later. So that was very normal to me, right? People going to hospitals, people getting checkups because that's how my family was. So again, I didn't understand why these people weren't, in my mind, taking their healthcare seriously <laughs> and going to the hospital. And I didn't understand at that point that, of course, our government had not been able to make provisions mm. for people like this. We, we don't, we still don't have a society like that in which healthcare is accessible to everybody. So I was like, look, I'm gonna be a doctor. I'm gonna do all these pro bono surgeries. I'm gonna help, in fact, I want to be a plastic surgeon oh, so I can okay. help like burn victims and swap like babies' clip, palate lips and everything. So I was like, that's what I'm gonna do. 
So fortunately, or unfortunately <laughs> for me, I didn't get into med school twice. Twice? Twice. And even my love for healthcare even really started because, so I wanted to be a surgeon, but also at the same time, right, plus a surgeon, also at the same time, my mom also really wanted us to like revise together. Mm. And my mom doesn't know science at all. Like she's not, <laughs> she's a complete humanities person. So I'd always bring home my science books so that those could be what we studied, um, but and she wouldn't help me. <laughs> um, so she would leave me yes. alone, literally. Um, but anyway, so I guess we continued and I didn't get into med school twice. So I applied the first time, right? What schools were you applying to? So um, in the UK how it works, I went to, I went, applied to Bristol, Liverpool, and there was one more else that I forget now. Yeah. So funny enough, I got into Bristol. I got my offer for Bristol. Um, and how it is, of course, you have to meet your grades, right? So I studied really, really hard. I didn't meet my grades for med school. And it was the most painful thing ever uh, because my whole identity, and I still feel like even my whole identity now, um, these people that knew me in the past before, was this girl that was going to be the doctor, right? Uh, I was like literally, in fact, even to the point that my friends, parents would even ask me, oh, Tito, how's the journey? Are you still going to, you know, what's going on? Things like that, because that was my that was, identity. Yeah. So I was distraught that first mm. time. Um, so then I went to Manchester and I studied biomedical sciences. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, 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 I'm still going to do this medicine thing. I applied while I was in Manchester. Still didn't get it. Still didn't get in. <laughs> and I remember my guidance counselor at that time was like, oh, so you know, have you ever thought about public health? Because when you speak, you talk about healthcare and all how you want to change things and you want to mm -hmm. go back to Nigeria and help your healthcare system. That really sounds like a public health thing right. apart from being a doctor. I was like, no, no, it's a doctor. She was like, okay, well, just think about it. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm actually so grateful for her because I don't think I would be in the sign. Maybe I'll still be trying, you know, year <laughs> apply for med school. I'm still failing to get in, right? Um, and. You know, I think the light bulb for me really hit, right, that I wanted to go into public health mm. was um, I was in Honduras and I was volunteering at a hospital there. So I love to travel. Um, I love to volunteer as well. So I was volunteering at a hospital there. And Honduras is exactly like Nigeria. They eat yam, they eat plantain. <laughs> the people act the same. The only difference is that they speak Spanish. Right. And speak <laughs> exactly. And we speak English, right? But their hospitals, I felt like I was in Nigeria in general. Hospital. There was, there was no difference. And it was like, so wow, across, it really clicked that wow, across developing countries, right? You're trying to, you're seeing basically the same thing. Yeah. These doctors are working their best. They're trying so hard to see as many patients as possible and give them the best care that they can within their reach. But they're only one person. Mm. They can only affect one person at a time. Mm. However, if Honduras or countries like Nigeria had different policies in place and actually made way for these kind of people to be able to support them and make sure that they had real access to good health care. We wouldn't be in this position yeah. in the first place, would we? So I was just like, right, public, public health, health is done. And then I moved back to Nigeria. Yeah. <laughs> so when you moved back to Nigeria, what did you do immediately? Um, well, I started my NYC, yeah. I have a picture of me in my copa <laughs> outfit and everything. Where did you serve? Um, in Lagos. <laughs> <laughs> I, I... But I was in camp and I loved it. So I kind of even like, I know a lot of people don't go to camp, but I actually love it. I enjoyed my camp too. I did mine in all your state. Really? Funny enough, I wanted time. to go to a quiet bomb. Um, it was a very real thing, um, but yeah, things <laughs> happened. <laughs> but yeah, I really wanted to go to a quiet bomb. But yeah, so I was in Lagos, but I loved the whole camp experience. In fact, they actually sent me out of camp. Uh -uh. Because I got sick and I didn't want oh. to go. <laughs> so, so I'm asthmatic. And like I was reacting to like the red soil because I just moved back everything. And I was wheezing, my inhaler wasn't working. Like, no, and I was like, no. <laughs> The, the, I forget what you call her, but the camp coordinates all the ladies. I was in charge of our platoon. She called my mom as because she was my emergency contact. She's like, please uh, come and pick your child. Because if I didn't pick you up, yeah, we're not live, we're not responsible. She doesn't want to go home. My mom was like, thank God for them actually being responsible yeah. and doing the right thing and looking out for you because. Okay, I just did. I was going to stay. I was having so much fun. <laughs> I was enjoying myself. So, anyway, after camp, um, I then served at the Lagos State AIDS Control Agency. Mm. Um, and that was really my first, you know, deep dive, uh, technically, even my first job, actually. Right. Um, and I think this is also for me where the passion as well for Helium Health came because we would go around to all these different general hospitals mm. and it would literally be stacks and stacks of paper. In fact, like one of our tasks was this thing called data validation, mm -hmm. right? And you know, it sounds super complicated, it really wasn't. <laughs> 
the whole point was that we wanted to make sure that the numbers that were being put into the platform, right, that they had, they had some kind of, was accurate. So again, not that the number of HIV positive men <laughs> over five, over 50, sorry, is, is four or is it five? So we would have to go back to the source um, right. form. So you'd go to the client intake forms, you start counting, you now cross check oh, no it with idea. the monthly summary registry. Then each, every single donor agency, they now have their own, um, what's it called, monthly summary form that that information is then put on. Before it's then put onto like a platform that every single donor agency maybe now has their own as well. And it was just so tedious because you should be going through hundreds of papers. Of papers. Damn. Hundreds of papers. And it's crazy because we would be in the month of, let's say, August, trying to validate data for February to tell you how <laughs> far behind we were. Yeah. It was, it was crazy. And for me, it, it almost seems so mind blowing that people are pouring millions of dollars mm. into HIV AIDS prevention, but we don't have real time data right. about whether the interventions are even working or not. Yeah. We don't know truly what's happening. And it was like, to me, it like, seemed like such a waste. So I'm also quite frugal as well with certain <laughs> things. So, so for me, it also seemed like such a waste. I'm like, I'm telling you that you're it literally, you're, you're, basically, you're almost burning this money. You're yeah. literally burning the money, right? Because what is then the point of all of this if you don't have real time accurate information yeah. and data? Um, so for me, it really spoke volumes as to why our healthcare system is the way it is, yeah. right? I always say this, that banking and finance was able to leapfrog and, yeah. you know, grow and heck, we're now one of the best countries that send money around, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, the US, they're just trying to catch up right now. Um, you know, same with telecoms, same with oil and gas because of data and technology. Mm. Healthcare got left behind because mm. we didn't invest in data and technology. So it's like, even now with like budgeting and financing and planning, right? It's like, oh, ah, what should we budget to the teaching hospitals? Okay, maybe the largest one, we <laughs> give the most money, right? It's, there's no there's in-depth no yeah. in information or data to allow us to be able to truly invest in our healthcare system and build it up, yeah. right? You know, again, they talk about, oh, we want to make a medical tourism hub. Okay, how do you want to yeah. do it? <laughs> with what data, with what information? And I think until we start doing that, start prioritizing that, then we're going to get left behind. Right. I mean, we're already behind. But What's it? At least it could, this, it could be. we could catch up, <laughs> literally. Amazing. So how did Helium Health then start? Because you mentioned that it was when you were doing this data validation at the um, government agency yeah. that you just realized that, okay, this is a problem that needs fixing. But then how did Helium Health now, like, okay, we're going to build this company? To solve mm -hmm. this problem. How did that happen? So what's interesting is that my two co-founders, Goke and Dimeji, they had originally sort of built businesses before, mm. sold it, um, and they'd gone to King's College together. So right. they were very, very familiar with themselves and very, and they have been friends for a very long time. And I'd known Dimeji through, I mean, I like to say life, because <laughs> like how everybody in Lagos seems is, to be connected yeah. some way, somehow, right? Um, you know, he went to law school, I have friends that went to law school with him, and we see each other randomly, things like that. And, you know, it was interesting because through one of our mutual friends, you know, we were having a conversation and they're like, oh yeah, you know, Dimitri and his, you know, his co-founder, okay, they're thinking about starting this thing, mm. whole one medical, you know, health tech, things like that. And, you know, Dimitri knows legal stuff and, you know, finance right. and things like that. Okay, is a product person, but they really don't have a healthcare person. Mm. And I think they need a healthcare person if they're gonna do this healthcare thing, right? And I was like, okay, um, I don't know. <laughs> you know, cause already at that stage, I had left Lagos State AIDS Control Agency. Mm. Um, I wanted to move to New York and, ah. you know, go and try the opposite end of <laughs> public health, right? So actually trying public health then, you know, funny enough with technology, I actually applied for it at, to work at a tech startup in New York. Um, and trying to find out what that was like there. Yeah. So, okay, I tried it in Nigeria, then let's try in the exact opposite where there's data see, and technology yeah. and truly see what the difference is before I wanted to go do my master's. So I was like, uh, I don't know, I sort of have my own plans, but anyway, let me just meet up with them, right? Because yeah. again, I like also like Faji as well, talking to people <laughs> like and they're networking. So what was supposed to be like an hour long conversation with Goke, Dimiji and I, um, ended up being like almost seven hours long. Literally, like we sat down and we, we talked about everything, we just about everything. And I think we all left literally that meeting being like, uh, no, this is it. We're, we're doing this <laughs> thing together. We're doing this thing together because 
like our minds were racing, like we were almost finishing each other's sentences, which wow. was weird, right? Because yeah. this is the first time I'm really meeting these people or really interacting with them on this level. And we just connected. And yeah, that's honestly how we then started. And truly, truly, when we started, we didn't even want to build an electronic medical records platform. Mm, what, did you guys want, what did you guys want? What we really wanted to do, right? Um, we wanted to pull together different data sources. Mm. So, you know, I spoke about how the different donor agencies would have their own, you know, platform and, you know, their ZHIS, our national one, and, you know, maybe different hospitals have their own. So we wanted to basically pull together data sources so create this platform where if you want to build a hospital, you could go on and find healthcare data right. in Nigeria, your government, things like that, right? So it's all in one place. We soon quickly realized that I know a lot of these <laughs> systems, you couldn't do that with them or the data was, it was secondary. So it wasn't clean data, right? And the only way to get real actual data is if you collect it at source. So we said, you know, so we're going to build our own solution that, yeah. that collects data at source, which is how we then started with an EMR. So our EMR was basically like a means to an end. Right. Yeah. Are you guys still going to go to that end? Is that still Oh no, the, definitely. The so I mean, the mission of the company, you know, is to use data and technology to right. accelerate healthcare in Africa. So, however, whichever technology it is that we need to be able to put in place to get that data, we're going to ensure that we do it right. And of course, you know, on the other hand, improve healthcare systems right by this technology so definitely it's it's because it's necessary right. if we're really serious about moving healthcare forward if we're really serious about universal healthcare then it's things like that right it's ensuring that you do have the technology what would you say is the, the biggest challenge you guys faced when you were just starting helium health so i would say the biggest challenge is definitely behavior right so just in general, I'd say Nigerians are very reactive people. We're not, we're not proactive when it comes to certain things. And it shows even in our healthcare systems as well, right? That we have a very reactive healthcare system as opposed to being proactive. So you would go to these hospitals and, you know, what we thought we would find were hospitals that didn't even know technology like this existed or yeah. that they could, you know, do things like this and get their information and get their data, right? We found hospitals that they had maybe used one in the past and dumped it. So yes. it's like, so it's like they, they knew about the benefits. Um, however, though, they were already scarred about it, right? right? Or it's that they knew that something like this existed, but they're like, no, 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 please, it's okay. It's not that serious, it's not that deep. <laughs> but they didn't really truly understand yet the benefits that they could get. Mm. Um, and we're also young as well. Right, I'm still young, still a baby girl, but you know, I mean, we were younger, right? This was how so many years ago? This was 2016, 2017, uh, yeah. So again, you know, I, and yeah, I remember so clearly people would say, I went to one of my aunties that, you know, she owns a hospital then, so we went to go and pitch that. She was like, Tita, my darling, you know, I care about you so much and I'll always support you in everything you do, but what? who do I hold? <laughs> <laughs> who do I hold if anything goes wrong? And I, thought, and, I, and I was so baffled by the question. I was like, oh no, auntie, it's us. And she started laughing. She said, no, 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 no. She said, you were, you were too small. She said, no, 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 <laughs> Who do I hold? I said, no, no, auntie, it's me. You come and hold me. I said, Tito, that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem because... <laughs> and then she called to you. I, no, not even based on familiarity. It was based on that. Like, in her mind, she's like, you're a child. Like, do you get what I mean? You know, what do you even have to your name that I even used to hold you for my hospital? And she was like, of course, hospitals are very sensitive places, right? And to be fair, like, you know, making mistakes with our solution can even possibly be the difference between life and death, right? Yeah. In a situation like that. So I got it in theory, but I just didn't realize it would be that bad. And what's interesting now is that, you know, she is now someone that's like, ah, but everybody is using your solution. So now I won't feel special if I start using it. Well, can you build my own solution? Uh, like, entire new one. I'm just like, wow. Auntie, no, because <laughs> when we are nobody and I was begging you, you're said looking you can't for who to hold. You're looking for who to hold. <laughs> now that everybody is using us, yeah, and I was saying I'm, I'm too big. <laughs> that oh, also the price as well is too high. No, sorry, you should have taken me when I was a nobody. Then. <laughs> but um, I think definitely our age played a factor. Mm. The fact as well that so many solutions had come into the market mm. that had left sort of a bad taste. So people were interested. And also, 
you know, people really didn't also understand the true, true benefits that they could get from having a solution like that. Mm. Um, so I think like those three factors as well really played a part. And we have very low spending power in Nigeria as well. So <laughs> we do. All, all our hard work is for, for peanuts, <laughs> <laughs> literally. That's amazing. And so it's been like five years now, four or mm -hmm. five years. And you guys are one of like the biggest health tech we companies. Are the biggest. <laughs> Are, there's there's are, no pride in this one. It's like, in case you're wondering, Please give me my flowers while I'm alive. <laughs> because you guys are the biggest. We are the biggest. Yes, what, I'll say what, my chest. What, you, what would you say is the? What's, what are the reasons behind this? What is the edge that Helium Health has? What's the advantage? How did you guys just come and even though they were already mm -hmm. um, EMR solutions in the market, you guys are like, you know, we're going to come here, we're going to change it, and you have changed it. What's behind so, it? So you know, what's interesting about it is that I say this all the time. Our solution, we did not. It is not a brand new thing, right? We didn't invent EMRs. Heck, mm -hmm. we've been around since like the 90s or 80s in the US, right? So it was not anything brand new, or even anything brand new that we brought to the market. I think the difference was, well, first of all, when I talk about our technology, right? We spend so much time into the design of the technology itself. Right. So we had looked at other EMRs and the big companies in the US, the Epic, the Cernas, and they all look like code. <laughs> I'm sorry, like, I have, at least I like to think that I have a pretty good level of education, right? Like, I went to a good university, I studied biomedical sciences, I'm, I'm smart, right? <laughs> but the thing is, like, you would look at these solutions, and I was not getting a headache. Like, I, I was sorry, and, you know, not that I'm the benchmark from the smartest person in the world, right? But, you know, at least I'm a pretty intelligent person, and I look at them and I find them complicated, and I don't even know where to begin. So now imagine bringing a solution like that to our environment where you know we have very low computer literacy mm. rates right where people maybe never have never touched a computer a day in their life for their work and you want to give them this complicated thing to start using they're going to dump it for you true <laughs> they will they will dump your solution for you and you would have wasted your money so we're like no that's not what we want right and that's the typical storylines with you know emrs or solutions that come into africa it's like oh maybe they used it for one month and it wasn't sustainable maybe they didn't even go live with the solution at all right because it was way too complex for the market mm. so so we really invested time in looking at our user experience. So um, our whole thing was that how do we create a solution that has sort of a social media feel because right. we could guarantee that, you know, these doctors, nurses, different healthcare professionals, right, that they may have never touched a computer a day in their life for any kind of formal work. Uh, they definitely have a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they use WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they use all these things. So how do we now sort of make it bright and colorful and sort of have that sort of social media feel. Right. So it makes them, so the solution isn't so it's scary. It's exciting for them. And it's exciting and it's bright and it's colorful and it's all these things, right? So that was really one, right? Our user experience that we still invest a lot of time into, um, how we do it. And then also, I think our dedication as well as the mm. founders, I said, huh, in fact, so, Goke and Dimitri and Ralph, they were doing networking themselves, <laughs> setting up wire back in the day. In fact, there was, I mean, it's crazy now that, you know, we're almost 100 staff and, you know, at one point Massive we were... Massive growth. Guy, 100 people <laughs> salary every month. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if, uh, you know, we were five people, so we did everything ourselves, right? Mm. So we would be support, we would do customer success, we would be growth, we would do operations, finance, legal, everything. Like, we had to be everything, right? Which meant that all our clients had a personal touch with us, right? Mm. Like, so it was personal um you know we would go heck and anybody could reach us at any time i had hospitals back in the day that they would call me at 2 a.m i say the solution is not working da, 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 da. and you maybe they're on the main line i lived on and i'll cross the mainland bridge at 2 a.m myself drive myself i'll get down to the hospital okay what's your issue da, da, da. they'll pass what i can't da, da, da. i can't log in this is your solution but don't be at 2 a.m i'll get there the caps lock is on <laughs> and i can't tell you the number of times so we had situations <laughs> like that, right? Or even that they just wanted to see us. Mind you, the solution may already be live, but it's working well at the hospital. Maybe the MDOs uh, of the hospital will just say, okay, they want to meet with us. So you two will get there, you're afraid. Oh God, we hope we don't lose this client. So, so that you get there. They just want to just. <laughs> <laughs> so again, and, and they still call us just to just to be very honest. With you. But I think in that beginning, knowing that they could reach any of us yeah, at, at any, any point in time and we were literally available to them right so literally we 
we put in we are dedicated night day 24 7 weekends whatever right like we didn't sleep at all i think that level of dedication showed them that oh no that these people that they're ready so i think that's even the one thing that really allowed us to get and grow because our solution in the beginning it, i mean i can say it's trash now but it's <laughs> the beginning solution because i mean it's definitely not as great as what it is now um or so many versions ahead we thank god but you know it really wasn't that good but a lot of hospitals still used and still adopted it because they knew yeah, we were they dedicated. Knew they knew that we sat down with them and we helped them problem solve and we really used their feedback to be able to come and improve the solution. So I think that, you know, genuinely us being those personal people, being available really helped us to be able to get even more clients. And we really grew through word of mouth, mm. to be very honest with you. Mm. Yeah. So like how many hospices currently use this solution? So I would say live, we have maybe just about 200, just, just under 200, yeah, live, That's which amazing. is crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah, across five countries. Damn. I know. Ghana, <laughs> Liberia, Senegal, Kenya, and of course, Nigeria. Yeah. Wow. So, like, so when you say like it's the biggest, you know exactly And, and the says. truth is that nobody else has done this, or has done this indigenously to this level, right? Mm. So there are other like EMR providers in Nigeria, but they're either resellers. So for example, maybe they're mm. reselling a solution from India or from the US, right? So it's not a real company yeah. or institution, or it's like a one man business, mm. right? We literally have set up like an institution. Mm. Like, you know, I make the joke that if anything happens to any of us, the founders, the business will carry on. Maybe they'll cry for one day, but <laughs> salary will still be paid and things will carry on, right? Because we've built this healthcare institution mm. that is bigger than us, the founders, right? Which That's is, amazing. again, what you're supposed to do. But nobody ever thinks about that with healthcare. Banking yeah. and finance, of course, oil and gas, of yeah. course. That. You think about it being an institution, right? And outliving you and all the different corporate governance and things like that. But when it comes to healthcare technology companies, I mean, there are already so many few of them anyway but again to now create an institution of it is very unheard of so yeah we've, we've done something magical I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed i'm so proud of you guys <laughs> like it's so like so i know from the outside that helium health is doing great but just hearing you tell the story i'm like <laughs> this is like it's so amazing so i know that when you guys started that your title was that of a co-founder chief operations or head of operations no, actually, I was co-founder and head of growth. Or oh, head of growth. Yeah, head of growth. And then you moved to head of public, public sector yeah, growth. So why why did you change? So the truth is that we just became more specialized. Mm -hmm. Like so, Ralph, um, who's one of our founding members, he has private sector growth. Right. Right. So for us to be able to scale and grow, everybody had to work with their strengths. Right. Ralph is great with all these private sector hospitals. They all love him. Like the facts <laughs> of they, they generally all love him, right? And I'm great with public sector people for some it's reason. Public health. Exactly, it's public health, right? So we really then come into sort of my own skill set and working with governmental agencies and donor agencies and understanding them and their protocols and their procedures. So basically, let's let's conquer, let's let's divide and conquer in short. Yeah. Amazing. I knew that one of the things you said when you're talking about growing up is that how you grew up with privilege. Mm -hmm. So now that you're building a business of your an institution of your own, how does being a daughter of Jim or of your come yeah. into play? Like especially now that you are lazy mostly with <laughs> government and government hospitals. So do you know the weird thing is that, you know, I've never and so me personally, right, I've grown up with the same people. So I've had the same friends. Mm since I was like 11, 12 years old. So I mean, Yamo that was on here, right? I've known Yamo since I was 12, mm. right? So, you know, and a whole bunch of other people as well. And we all grew up together. Yeah, together. And, you know, when you grow up with certain people, right? Um, you know, nobody is looking at, oh, whose mommy does this? Or whose daddy is who? Or anything <laughs> sure. like that, right? Because you're friends as kids because you like to play with each other, right? <laughs> so, yes, of course, you know that you come from a privileged family, right? Most definitely. And, you know, you're grateful for everything that you have and the access that you have and everything, right? But, you know, to today and moving back, it still baffles me how people can't dissociate the mm. two of us, right? Right. Um, it's a very real thing that people, you know, assume that, oh, and now, but it's her daddy that did this, her daddy the fact so In fact, if you allow them, they'll say the whole of Helium Health is your daddy. my daddy, <laughs> right? So, you know, and I would love for it to be my daddy because it would make my work easier, right? <laughs> because, you know, and, and it's, it's tough, right? So it's, it's tough for me because, you know, 
emotionally, it feels as if that, you know, there's no how much of hard work you do. Mm. Doesn't in mm. fact if you like go and raise two hundred million dollars. They will still say they will say if you like let Google come and buy you for a billion dollars, they will say it's yeah. my daddy. And so, you know, it, it fucks with me emotionally. Um, and then also I then get really worried about my co-founders as well mm. because they work. Mm. They, they put in their time, they put in their hours and everything like that. So that, you know, you have all these guys and they're doing everything that they do their can. Everybody is pushing. And then for somebody from the outside to now oh, see. No, discourage like all of their work and basically I say, oh, it means it. nothing um, because of this person comes from a privileged family or they have a privileged dad or anything like that. It's still so baffling, um, you know. And I think that, you know, as I, I've gotten older and I'm continuing to grow and learn, it's the kind of thing that I realize that it doesn't matter mm. at the end of the day. Um, I can't change who my father is. He is, he who he is. <laughs> Whoever doesn't like it, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, there's nothing I can do. Um, and, you know, if people actually truly knew me as a person, in yeah. fact, if they even understood the kind of household I come from, mm. that slackers are not allowed, <laughs> that you would know that there is no way for there to even be a chance where, oh, you know, I'm just there I'm filing just my nails, I'm like just chilling, just and dollars are raining <laughs> on me. It's, it's, not, it's not a thing. Um, you know, what's interesting is that I don't think a lot of people know this. My dad actually didn't want me to do um, he didn't want me to even study medicine. Oh wow! Oh yeah, it was a oh, it caused a big fight too in our household. It was a it was a serious thing. If I said he's not paying for university, if I go and study medicine, I should go and study accounting and finance. <laughs> come and take over. I should come and study accounting and finance. What's all this healthcare that I care too much about people? Da, da, da. So now I imagine that you now move back and you know you're like okay, right? He's okay. You've worked. I've given you a one year. You worked in government. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Go on. Either you go and work in the bank, or either you go and work in. And when you say work in the bank, he's not giving you corner office in head office. <laughs> you go and start from the bottom as cash and teller first, <laughs> and then you work your way up like everybody else, right? Or you go and do consulting because all this healthcare. Thing, I don't. I was like, no, I'm gonna do this thing. So for the long time, he used to call us an NGO. I said, like, oh, how's your NGO going? <laughs> like you know this thing you help get people things like you just love helping people and he used to be embarrassed to tell people what i did he's wow. yeah because for him he just didn't obviously i mean we've changed now so i hope it's changed now right so he's, <laughs> he's now actually proud of me but um yeah it was a really different thing so a lot of people don't see that um they don't see i guess the background and to be fair, it's not for them to see yeah. anyway in the first place but yeah, no slackers allowed in my house. <laughs> in short. Amazing. So uh, we're going to wrap up real quick, but one of the questions I have now is about Magic Fund. Mm -hmm. So I know that you, Goki and Dimeji, are also running Magic Fund, which is a, yes. an angel investor or a VC company. Yes. Which of it? So what we are is that we're, oh, we're a whole bunch of founders that have our own sort of fund. It's our basically right. our fund. Exactly. Um, and what kind of business do you invest in? So we invest sort of across board in very early stage startups, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is that even at their pre-seed, mm -hmm. you know, we basically try and get to them. Um, and the truth of the matter is that we saw the opportunity when we were in Y Combinator mm -hmm. that, you know, there are all these great and amazing companies and everything like that, that we have around them and we have the access to them. And we can smell bullshit because we <laughs> ourselves too, we've been we've in been that there. position as well, yeah. right? So being part of that and seeing their growth and actually understanding it, because we saw that, you know, sometimes as founders, like, yeah, money is great, but you don't want people that are harassing people, that are stressing. You want people that truly actually can then help you provide value, mm -hmm. right? And do introductions and things like that. So us as well, being able to be in that unique position where we're founders as well, right? We're with you guys, we're not some stuffy, huge VC yeah. that is looking down on you or anything like that. We understand your challenges you're going through. We understand how difficult it might be to be able to scale and grow. We can give you real advice from people yeah. that, too, that are going through it, right? Um, and again, just trying to put little small, small checks in here. And here. So, <laughs> so what's yeah. the size of the checks that you guys put in? So we do anything, I mean, anything like $50,000, $100,000, things like that. Yeah, even we even be smaller as well, $25,000. So now um, we're actually on our fund too oh, nice. that we're raising. So it's actually quite exciting. So that's about a $15 million fund. So I know that yeah. I'm not 15 again. <laughs> I mean, but I don't even really talk, it's, it's crazy, right? But I don't even really talk about it. But even sort of the portfolios of companies that we've had are fantastic. We've mm. even had like two exits as well, like from our Already? fund. Yeah, literally. <laughs> and we started this one in 2017. And this is something that we just did 
casually on the side just on the side let it not be on the side because we're like ah, how these companies are here there's such a great opportunity and we know people that would definitely want to be able to put money in and want to be invested but they don't have the access mm. right so us being able to vet them through get access to these great companies as well you know be able to go through them from our own experience um how do we now sort of bring them to light yeah it's called the magic fund it's exciting <laughs> that's so amazing what did you yeah. wish that you knew at 21. i wish i knew that i was past my grades mm. so when i say you know no slackers allowed in my family i really mean it right so the kind of household i grew up in and of course the nigerian environment is that your grades are everything mm. um and let me be honest with you i got a third in uni right um you know i didn't do well at <laughs> all i got a third and at that point in time in 21 when i was about graduating i assumed that if you didn't get a first class that then your and you got a third then you were going to be in mcdonald's flipping burgers honestly i truly truly believe that so i didn't have so my confidence was shattered when i moved back to nigeria and i got my third because i honestly didn't believe that i was somebody without a good grade mm. what i didn't know now in the real world is that nobody asks you what you got to university you nobody just, cares you what you studied just, can you do the work in fact yeah. they don't even care whether you went or not to university so i wish that that wasn't so ingrained in me that you know what your grades are everything if you don't get good grades you won't succeed in life you don't and it's something i said i'll always tell my children that look grades are fantastic go get that sheet of paper if you want to go and get it right but it matters about you as a person right now so now that i even hire people i can't tell you where people went to university i don't care, don't care. i don't know what grade they got in university or what mark they made because it doesn't matter it's the person performing mm. that is what matters um, and I wish that, you know, maybe I wouldn't have made so many mistakes later on in <laughs> life, but I wish I was more forgiving to myself and I understood that then when I was 21. Mm, yeah. Amazing. What's your favorite food? Oh, asu. <laughs> oh, God. I love some asu. In fact, that's what I'm craving right now. Asu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I can feel you like just ah, yeah, I used to go and I'm, get us. I'm going to buy right asu right now. <laughs> this literally. You say you like traveling. What's your favorite city? Hmm. Oof. Too many. I really love Marrakesh. Mm. And I think maybe as well because like Aladdin is possibly one of my favorite like <laughs> Disney movies. So I literally felt like I walked into like Aladdin like the first time <laughs> I went. Like it literally it That's so cute. <laughs> Like literally, I knew everyone was gonna watch this when I roll there. I was like, oh my god, this girl. <laughs> um, but yeah, honestly, I literally felt like I was like in Aladdin. And it was like it was, it's like if anyway, if you've never been, it's so beautiful. It's literally like such a magical place. Yeah. And the food is great. And when you're not working, what what are you most likely to be caught doing? Yeah, watching TV shows. <laughs> like Aladdin. Like, no, like Aladdin. <laughs> like we've 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 progressed now. I'm I'm rewatching Grey's Anatomy right now, so Oh my god, you're going to do food to seventeen season. Yeah. And I've been doing, I've been binge watching it. So now I'm even on season 14. Ah, so when did you and start? I'm ashamed to say, because <laughs> I've been investors by watching seriously, I don't work. Okay, <laughs> okay. just, but just me. Tell me after this. Exactly, I'll tell you after. <laughs> okay, and final question. It's been an amazing conversation to um, upcoming entrepreneurs, especially female entrepreneurs, because we still don't have, don't have as many female entrepreneurs in tech, especially mm -hmm. as we should have. So for women who want to get into tech as founders, as co-founders, as CEOs, what would you, what would be your advice? Or what's that one lesson you've learned in your journey so far that you think if you tell them, it can make them move forward faster? So what I found, and I think there's even a statistic about this, right? That if you do have sort of women as founders or women in management, it actually attracts more women to the business, mm -hmm. right? Because it then sends the signal that this is, an enabling environment or this is not going to be an, a, a quote-unquote boys club mm. right um yeah i forgot what the statistic is but something like that so i would say that women that currently already are in positions where they can hire other women where they, they should actively do it like i've told in fact each of our head of hr that is we need to be 70 percent women in this company <laughs> as well because we are the better sex but also <laughs> as well also as well right that it's just it sends the signal that look we are open for business for other women mm. um so again if women are in positions of power where they can be able to hire more women actively search for women for different roles 
then do it, right? right. Open, literally open, open up your doors. And I'm just saying in general, right, for women that want to possibly start their own business and everything, that yes, especially in Nigeria, people are sexist. <laughs> that it is, it is going to happen because unfortunately our, our, our people are not mature enough yet <laughs> let's just put it like that but the thing is just put on your blinders just move forward if it's something that you truly want to do That's let your right. work speak for itself mm. let your passion speak for itself you know but those comments they will definitely come and you just literally have to build like tough skin around it don't get me wrong it doesn't mean that you should take it lying down you should be quiet or anything like that it's like call out people you know <laughs> that say your work but is not so speak up so speak up and show up right but also like i'm also not going to give somebody a job just because they're a woman just because they're a man it's based on your work yeah like plain and simple right so if your work is fantastic your work will speak for yourself end the story Amazing. If your work is fantastic, it's going to speak for itself. So yes. whether you're a woman or you're a man, mostly women, actually, please go ahead and <laughs> speak up and show up. Thank yes. you so much. Pizza. Thank you so much. It was much. amazing just getting to know you <laughs> and your story. I am so impressed. Like I'm like, I, I want, I'm really looking forward to speak to Tito. And just letting about, but now I'm like, I'm so <laughs> glad that it happened. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, thank guys. You. Thank you so much for watching this video to the end. Leave your comment, share. Talk about the video, let us know what you learned, leave your questions in the comment section and make sure you don't leave this video without subscribing. Peace out.